All right, Chemistry 3101. This is section 7.6, which is an introduction to E2 reactions. So we looked at elimination reactions a little bit earlier, but when we take an alkyl halide or substrate and we treat it with a strong base, it can undergo an elimination. We call this <clears throat> a beta elimination, or sometimes we call it a one-two elimination to form an alkene. The reason why we call it a beta elimination is because if you look at your substrate, your alkyl halide right here, you see you have the alpha carbon. That's the one the halogen is directly attached to. Well, if you look at the next carbons, those are beta carbons. So here they've showed a beta carbon. And if you pluck or abstract a beta hydrogen, a hydrogen attached to the beta carbon, you can produce a double bond. See that it's removing this proton, you're forming the double bond, and you're losing the leaving group simultaneously. And that's the reaction mechanism that is shown here. So we are seeing a proton transfer and a loss of a leaving group occurring simultaneously. Thus, this is a concerted mechanism. Remember, concerted mechanisms are ones where all steps occur at the same time. So you can think of the E2 reaction as an E together. Right, both steps are happening together in the E2 reaction. Well, again, E2 is a concerted process where the base removes that beta proton. We have the leaving group leaving, and we form a new double bond. So the concerted elimination is a bimolecular process and is going to follow second order kinetics, just like for an SN2. So this rate law is the same same as the rate law that we saw for an SN2 reaction, that the reaction rate depends on uh, or the concentration of the alkyl halide, our substrate, and the concentration of our base. All right, what does E2 stand for? Well, E stands for elimination, and 2 stands for bimolecular. So again, I'm kind of repeating myself here on these slides, but you need to understand that an SN2 is a concerted process. It's bimolecular. It's a substitution. And E2 is a concerted pro process. It's an elimination and it is bimolecular. Well, when would we consider something like sodium hydroxide a nucleophile or a base? Because we know that hydroxide has a negative charge. We know that hydroxide is a base from general chemistry, but we also know that it can be a nucleophile. So how do we know when it's gonna behave as which? Well, when we're dealing with hydroxide in a substitution reaction, we have to have a substrate that is not sterically hindered. So say, for example, we're talking about a tertiary substrate as is shown right here. Well, if we wanna use hydroxide as a nucleophile with a tertiary substrate, it doesn't work. Right? It doesn't work, why? Because it's too sterically hindered. If we have a tertiary substrate, it's actually gonna behave as a base because the beta protons are gonna be on the outside or you know, farther or not, far enough away from that sterically hindered carbon, this one here, that they can be removed in order to produce an elimination reaction. I mean, what's the bottom line? What's the take home message here? Is that when we had a substrate that wasn't sterically hindered, like a methyl or a primary alkyl halide? Well, in those cases, we saw that substitution was the preferred, um, the preferred pathway. Whereas if we have a tertiary or a secondary alkyl halide, what we're gonna see is that elimination will predominate. Well, you probably noticed that when we do an elimination reaction, we end up making an alkene. And if we're gonna make alkenes, we should learn how to name alkenes, which brings us to the next section, section 7.7, .7, which deals with alkene nomenclature. We've already looked at nomenclature in this chapter, the nomenclature of our substrates, our alkyl halides, but now we're gonna talk about the names of alkenes. And later on, we're gonna do an entire chapter where we look at the reactions of alkenes. And so we're gonna talk about alkenes a lot in Organic Chemistry 1. I usually say this before we embark on some new nomenclature, but the good news is that whatever you learn in the alkane nomenclature, in the haloalkane nomenclature, you're gonna be able to apply those principles to alkene nomenclature. So. Very similar to alkane nomenclature, we just have some minor modifications. 
The first one is that we find the longest carbon chain, which is our parent, but it's got to include the carbon-carbon double bond. So not only do we find the longest carbon chain, but it's got to have that um, pi bond in it. We identify, name the substituents, right? Chloro, bromo, fluoro, isopropyl, isobutyl, terbutyl, whatever. We assign a locant and a prefix, like two, three, is a di, tri, so on and so forth. But we number that carbon chain, our parent chain, such that we give the carbon covered double bond the lowest possible number. Now, I know there's two numbers in a carbon carbon double bond. Let's say it was on carbons two and three, right? But you start on one carbon and you go to the next, okay? And we want to assign whichever carbon we can the lowest possible number. We list the number substituents before the name, ignoring prefixes, except iso, cyclo, and neo. We don't ignore those. Um, put them in alphabetical order. And then the locant for the double bond can be placed either before the parent name or just after the ene suffix. Like, say, for example, you had this molecule. You could either call this like one, two, three, four, five. You could either call this two pentene. Or you could call it pent to ene. Either one is acceptable according to IUPAC. I don't use the second one a lot. Um, I just don't. I usually just use this here. I find that students, you know, seem uh, seem to find that one a little easier to remember. But again, either way is totally fine. Let's take a look at some examples of this parent chain thing, right? Let's say we had a five carbon alkane. That was a straight chain alkene that would be pentane. So when we have an alkene, we change the suffix to ene. So we go from ene to ene. Now, again, we want to number this chain to give the double bond the lowest possible number. So I have one, two, three, four, five. And so the actual name of this compound would be one pentene. Here's an example of a hydrocarbon, no double bond. The longest carbon chain has eight carbons. If we put a double bond right here to make this alkene, well, now the longest carbon chain has to what? It has to contain that double bond. So here we have what? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's not eight carbons. It's not this, these eight carbons because those eight carbons do not contain the double bond. So here we have a three propyl, one heptene. That would be the name of this compound. I'll scribble it down here. Three propyl, one heptene or you could call it 3 propyl hept one -ene. Either one is perfectly acceptable. Again, you want to give that carbon-carbon double bond the lowest possible number. You look at this molecule here, and we've numbered the longest carbon chain, and we've given the first carbon the lowest possible number, so this would be 2 heptene. But you see you've got these methyl groups over here. So a trap that students fall into sometimes is they'll remember the old rules for alkanes which say, you number the longest carbon chain and you want to give the first substituent the lowest possible number. That goes out the window when you're naming an alkene. You just want to give the carbon carbon double bond the lowest possible number. And so here we have 556 five, trimethyl 2 heptene. So this would be 556 five, trimethyl because we have three methyls 2 heptene. All right. There we go. We list the numbered substituents. Uh, yep. We list the numbered substituents before the name, okay, as always. And again, you can name it either a 2 heptene or a heptatuene. Either one is perfectly acceptable in chemistry 3101. Now, keep in mind that this alkene has the E configuration. It's also. Uh, uh, trans, either way, um, but you should indicate that at the beginning. And so the actual compound is E556 trimethyl hept 2 ene. So if I go back here, it actually is an E compound. All right, there you go. Remember um, E and Z stereois stereoisomers, right? We go basically off of atomic number. So if we look at the two carbons here, I'll highlight this one in black and I'll highlight this one in blue. The one in black, you can see that the fluorine is gonna take precedence because fluorine has a higher atomic number than carbon. And then in the carbon in blue, nitrogen has a higher atomic number than hydrogen. And so 
since those are on the same side, this would be a zusammen or a Z compound. Zusammen means together, okay? It's German for together. All right, there we go. Well, here we have the E isomer and the Z isomer. We've already covered that. So with all of that stuff in mind, let's see if we can provide some systematic names for each of these compounds. So let's give it the old college try here. We'll start with C. And you can see that in C, the longest carbon chain goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven carbons. And we have the double bond on carbon number two. Let me use my red pen to number these maybe. So we have carbon one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Like that. We've got methyl groups at carbons two and three and five so it's a two three five trimethyl two uh two um heptene and then we should designate this as being e or z could anybody tell me if this compound is e or z or neither this compound here would this be an e compound z compound Well, remember that on carbon number one, we also have a methyl group, right? There's a CH3 group here. And whenever you have two groups that are identical on the same carbon, there is no E or Z. So the answer is it's neither. This one is not E and it's not Z. So if we put this all together, we get two, three, five. So two, three, five, trimethyl. Two, heptene. And again, there's no E or Z to be concerned about. All right, let's move on to the next one. So this is E. Uh, the longest carbon chain has to contain our double bond. So it really doesn't matter. I mean, there's many ways. You could go this way, or you could go you know, this way. And either way, you end up with the same thing. You could go this way. And no matter what, you end up with the same molecule. So if I number that carbon chain, I'll start with the first carbon in my double bond, one, two, three, four, five, like that. So we've got a three isopropyl, right? This is an isopropyl. We have a methyl group at carbon four. We have another methyl group at carbon two. So we've got a two, four dimethyl. And then the longest carbon chain has five carbons. So it's a one pentene. Isopropyl comes before um, methyl, dimethyl. So if we put all that together, we get three isopropyl. So let's scribble this down. We get three isopropyl, two, four dimethyl, one pentene. There you have it. I'm gonna skip G for now. The solution is in the solutions manual. I encourage you to look at that because I want to skip ahead and try the bicyclic one. So let's move ahead and we'll try the bicyclic one here. So a bicyclic compound. Remember, we looked at these way back in chapter four. We start with a bridgehead carbon. There are two bridgehead carbons. Remember that we have three bridges. We have a bridge with one carbon. We have a bridge here with two carbons. And we have another bridge here with two carbons. But we're going to number the bridge with the double bond first. Why? Because we want to give the alkene the lowest possible number. All right? So we would start at the bridgehead. You could start either one because it's symmetrical. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is some kind of bicyclo um, two heptene because my double bond is at carbon two. So this is a bicyclo, let me write down what I know. We've got bicyclo something, 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 two heptene. Okay, what are the three numbers that are gonna be inside the, the square brackets? Could anybody tell me what the three numbers would be? Exactly. Thanks, Bruna. It would be two, two, one. Absolutely. Yes, Mackenzie, both 
100% correct. Yep. And then we've got a 2,3 dimethyl. And that's it. So we've got 2,3 dimethyl bicyclo 221 um, at uh, 2 heptene. You know, I'm going to make a couple changes here because I'm not supposed to use commas, am I? So you're actually supposed to use periods or decimals here, like that. Also, something about the two heptene, I always think it looks nicer if you start with letters here, like that. Hept two heptene, either way is correct. There's nothing wrong with the way I had it before. I just like to follow up a square bracket with a letter. It's just one of my things. <laughs> just a personal preference. But again, I encourage you to take a look at G and all the other problems in question 7.12. And make sure that you're rock solid on your alkene nomenclature. Well, what else do we know about alkenes? What about alkene stability? All right, if you were to compare these two isomeric alkenes, these are diastereomers, trans-2-butene and cis-2-butene. All right, they both have the same connectivity. They both go CH3, CH, double bond, CH, CH3, like that. So they are stereoisomers. But if you were to make a molecular model, and these models here, these are called space filling models. They're supposed to represent how much space the atoms take up, their electron clouds. Um, you can see that trans-2-butene is less sterically hindered than cis-2-butene, right? You get the two methyl groups next to each other, and they cause some steric strain. And so trans-2-butene is actually more stable than cis-2-butene, and I can prove it using numbers. You can quantify it using heats of, hydro, um, uh, heats of combustion. So if you do the same reaction for both of these, right, you just burn the trans-2-butene and the cis-2-butene, what you see is that the trans-2-butene releases less energy, right? What does that tell you? It tells you it was more stable to begin with if it's releasing less energy. So the, the cis isomer is four kilojoules per mole less stable than the um, trans isomer, or put the way it is here, trans is four kilojoules per mole, more stable than the cis isomer. Either way, you want to slice it. If you're the kind of person who needs to see, you know, uh, an enthalpy diagram, all you see is that there's a difference of four kilojoules per mole here. And again, that is based off of that steric strain of having those two methyl groups right next to each other in the cis to butene molecule. Well, what else about the stability of alkenes? This is something that's going to come up a lot in section 7.8, is that as we increase the substitution on our double bond, the alkene becomes more and more stable. Let me show you what I mean. If you look over here on the far left, you see how you have this alkene, but there's only one substituent on it, this butyl group. Well, that is less stable than if you have an alkene with two substituents on it. So here we have two ethyl groups. What if you had an ethyl and two methyls, right? Then it's called tri-substituted. But if you have all carbons maxed out in terms of R groups, it becomes more stabilized. And the reason why is because the sp2 hybridized carbons in the double bond, they get more stabilized by a hyperconjugation by those um, electron donating alkyl groups. So this is something, again, it's going to come up a lot in section 7.8, that the more substituted an alkene is, the, uh, the more stable it is. If you've ever wondered about double bonds in a ring, well, we can have a ring with a double bond. Right here we have cyclopropene, cyclobutene, cyclopentene, cyclohexene, so, and then you can have cycloheptene, so on and so forth. But when you look at cycloalkenes that have less than seven carbons, so when we have less than seven carbons, only the double bond can only be cis. Right, you see how both of these hydrogens are on the same side, right? Both of these R groups are on the same side, right? It is cis in cyclohexene. Same thing here and the same thing for the other ones too, okay? Everything is cis, cyclopropene, cyclobutene, cyclopentene, and cyclohexene. It's not until you get to carbons, or sorry, rings that have eight carbons or more that you could have trans. And I mean, that's really all you need to know is that if you have an eight, eight-membered ring and larger that you can have a trans double bond in it. When you apply that rule to bridged um, bicycloalkenes, I should say alkenes, not al alkenes, it's called Brett's rule. I'm never going to ask you about Brett's rule. I've never asked a student a question about Brett's rule on a quiz. 
and I've never asked it on an exam and I've never seen it on an ACS exam. So uh, just put that there. All right, but I do want you to be able to answer this question. If I was to call these alkenes A, B, and C, could anybody tell me which one of these would be the most stable? They're all isomers. They all have the same molecular formula. But could anybody tell me which one of these alkenes would be the most stable? And it's not a trick question. Remember that the more substitution we have on a double bond, the more stable it becomes. Right here we have a double bond, here we have a double bond, and here we have a double bond. Well, the first one is tetra substituted, tetra substituted. This one here is di substituted. Right, it's only got the two R groups over here. Right, this one's got three R groups attached to it. Or sorry, four R groups attached to it. All right, and the last one, C, is tri-substituted. Tri-substituted, right? We have an R group here, we have one here, and we have one here. So based off of that, can anybody tell me which one would be the most stable? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's going to be A, because A is tetra-substituted. Remember, the more substitution you have, the more stable it becomes. Let's go back. And you see here that the stability increases as you have more substitution. So that means that in this question, since A has the most substitution, it is going to be the most stable. Then the one that is di substituted would be the least stable. And the one that is tri substituted would be in the middle, intermediate, intermediate stability. And like I told you, this concept is going to come up a heck of a lot in uh, section 7.8. Let's talk about alkene isomerism. Remember I mentioned Brett's rule and I've never asked you, I will never ask you about Brett's rule. Brett's rule is nothing more than you'll never have a double bond at a bridgehead carbon. Okay, it's really nothing more than that. All right. Um, you can have compounds where you do have a double bond at the bridge carbon, but it's got to have at least six or sorry, eight carbons in the ring in order to do that. So you could make a model to prove this to you. But um, again, I've never asked students about it before, so I'm not going to start asking about it now. All right. With that in mind, let's move on to section 7.8, which deals with regio selectivity. I knew I wanted to at least introduce you to the concept of regioselectivity today. You know, what does the name suggest? Regioselectivity. Well, selectivity kind of tells you what it is. It's selective, but regioselectivity means it's selective for a specific region in a molecule. Check this out here. You have this alkyl halide. So this is what? 2-bromo-2-methyl butane. If you treat this with sodium ethoxide, um, What's going to happen? Well, this is a tertiary alkyl halide. It's too sterically hindered in order for, or for a substitution reaction to occur. So that means that my ethoxide is going to behave as a base. So I'm going to get an elimination reaction, an E2 reaction, right? But how is that E2 reaction going to occur? If you look carefully at the substrate, what do you notice? You notice that you've got an alpha carbon right here. Maybe I'll write it like this. But you've got three beta carbons. You've got these ones here, and then you have this one over here. Why did I use two different colors to label three different beta carbons? Because the two that I have in blue, they're identical. They're both methyl groups, whereas this one I have uh, written uh, with the green letter beta next to it is a methylene. So it's not identical to the two ones in blue. Well, then that begs the question, what would happen if you were to remove the beta proton or a beta proton from this carbon versus what would happen if you were to remove a beta proton from this methyl group, say? Well, what you'd see is that if you were to remove the proton in blue, and we'll look at the mechanism, you would end up with this product here. And if you were to remove the proton in green, you would end up with this product here. 
Now, if you look at the percent yield, you see that the one that's in the green box is produced in a higher yield than the one in the blue box. What's going on here? Well, because we get two products, what happens is the more stable product is going to be the major product, right? Why is this more stable? Because this is a tri substituted alkene, tri substituted, and this one is only di substituted. Now, notice that we have names for these. We call the more stable product the Zaitsev product. Again, it is the more stable. Okay. And the other one we call it the Hoffman product. It is the less substituted and therefore the less stable product. Kind of cool, huh? Well, that's where I told you that we would apply substitution in this section. And we're going to see that come up a lot. So what we say is that this elimination reaction is regioselective. If I just pull off the proton um, that I had highlighted in green, which was this one here, how is this going to work? Let's practice drawing our E2 mechanism. I have my ethoxide ion. Put in my lone pairs. What's it going to do? It's going to do the proton transfer. I'm going to form the double bond and I'm going to lose my leaving group altogether. It's an E2 reaction, an E2 gather. It's a, um, it's a concerted mechanism. And this, again, shows the formation of the Zaitsev product. When we end up with a couple of different products and one of them is a major product, we say it's regioselective, right? The reaction is more selective for the Zaitsev product than it is for the Hoffman product. Now, you might be asking, and this would be a good question, you might say, okay, well, you're getting this in higher yield. How would you, what if you wanted to get that? You know, what if you wanted to get more of the Hoffman product? Do you just bite the bullet and make it in a low yield and try to purify? No, there's a way to get more of the Hoffman product. Let me show you what you would do. If you look at this experiment here, and this is what we've talked about so far, if you use ethoxide as your base, you have 2-bromo-2-methyl butane, we saw that you get mostly Zaitsev and a little bit of the Hoffman product. But what happens when you use something like T-butoxide, which is this guy right here, this is T-butoxide. Well, this is a much more sterically hindered base, right? Because we've got three methyl groups, right? We have a methyl group here, another one here, another one here. Well, this base is just so big and bulky that it's got a problem. When it approaches the substrate, you've got the proton in green and you've got the proton in blue. Since it's so dang big and bulky, it has a really hard time getting in to abstract this proton, right? It has a hard time doing that. Why? Because this carbon has two groups attached to it. Whereas it has a much easier time getting this proton because this carbon only has one group attached to it. All right. It's less sterically hindered. And so it can pluck this guy off and form the Hoffman product. You can probably guess what happens that if your base is even bulkier, right, like this one here, then you're going to get the Hoffman product in an even higher yield. And so, what's the bottom? What's the the bottom line, or what's the take-home message from this slide? Is that if you have a sterically hindered base, it's going to favor the formation of the Hoffman product. Whereas if you have an unhindered base like ethoxide, you end up with mostly the Zaitsev product. So if we were to make some notes on our table here, we would call these here. These are hindered bases. Hindered bases. And this one here is an unhindered base. And that's it. The unhindered base is like a, it's like a ninja. It can get in there and it can pluck out that proton that's, you know, more sterically hindered just so you, it can give you the more stable product, whereas these ones are just so big, they're like, I'll just grab the first thing I can. You know, they, just, they just need more space. All right, give me a thumbs up if you follow me on the concept of regioselectivity. You get more Zaitsev product when we use an unhindered base, and we get more Hoffman product when we use a hindered base.
Everybody with me on that idea? Is anybody with me on that idea? Okay, well, let's take a look at the types of hysterically hindered bases that we could use to favor the Hoffman product. A real classic is potassium t-butoxide. I mentioned this earlier, so t-butoxide, it's, it's um, cation is usually potassium, and there's a reason for that, but I'm not going to get into that. Others would be things like disopropylamine and triethylamine. Triethylamine, we have an acronym for that, which is T-E-A. Diisopropylamine, um, I can't think of the acronym for that right at the moment. But these are sterically hindered bases, right? They have these big alkyl groups, which makes them really sterically hindered. And so they're going to pull off the low-hanging fruit or the proton that is most readily available to produce the Hoffman product, which is the less stable alkene. Let's take a look at a practice problem here. This is practice of skill 7.18. It asks us to predict the major and minor products for these E2 reactions. So they're telling us that we're going to, we're looking at E2 reactions. That means we're going to make alkenes, right? We're going to be producing alkenes. Okay. So here we have sodium ethoxide. Ethoxide is an unhindered, unhindered base. Here is the alpha carbon. We've got this beta carbon. We've got this beta carbon. And then we also have this beta carbon here. The beta carbon that's highlighted in yellow has no hydrogens attached to it. So we'll just delete that one. But could anybody tell me where would the ethoxide pull the proton from preferentially? From the beta carbon highlighted in blue or the one in green? Well, if you're unsure, if we write down the green proton, I'll put it like this, okay? And if we write down the blue proton, I'll write it like this, okay? I'm just gonna draw the mechanism for the abstraction of the blue proton. We have our ethoxide, I'll write it down here. It's going to take the blue proton, form the double bond, and we're gonna lose the leaving group. I'll write the product in blue just to be consistent with my colors. And here is what we would get. We'd end up with this compound, and we have this gem dimethyl here. We would also end up with abstraction of the green proton, which would give us what? Would give us a six-membered ring. We still have these two methyls, but now we would have our double bond here. Could anybody tell me which one of these would be the major product? Would it be the one in blue or the one in green? Keep in mind that the one that's in blue is tri-substituted. This is tri-substituted, whereas this one here is only di-substituted. So it's going to be the one in blue that is going to be the major product. This is the major product, which is the Zaitsev product. This will be the minor product, which is the Hoffman product. And there you go. Let's try the next one. We have sodium hydroxide. We have what? A tertiary alkyl halide, just like we did up here. So substitution is not going to occur. We've got a strong base, strong nucleophile. We've got two types of beta protons. We have the ones on the methyl groups, and then we also have the ones here on this methylene. If I was to rip off the one off the methylene, I would end up with this product. I have this as my product. If I was to rip off the one in red, I'll draw the mechanism for it. I would end up plucking this proton, making the double bond, losing the leaving group. And that would give me this. Well, if I look at these two alkenes, you can see that this one is tri-substituted, and this one is only di-substituted. So that means the tri-substituted would be the major product, the Zaitsev product, and then the other one would be the minor product, 
or the Hoffman product. All right, remember hydroxide is an unhindered base. All right, well, let's take a look at the last one. I have the same substrate that I did in the previous problem. I'll write down the protons in the same color, in red and in blue. If I have potassium t-butoxide, I'm gonna draw the Lewis structure of the base. Here's my base. I've got three methyl groups on here. Would this be a hindered base or an unhindered base? Could anybody tell me? And I left the spectator eye on it. Exactly. Now we're dealing with a hindered base. Exactly. This is a hindered base, big time hindered base, right? So which proton is it going to pull off preferentially? It's going to pull off the one in red. Exactly. So it's going to pull off this guy preferentially. Okay. And when we pull off the one in red, we end up with the same products as before. Okay. Plus, we end up with this guy. But now the one in red is going to be the major product. Major product. And the one in blue is going to be the minor product. And again, the reason why is because we're dealing with a hindered base. So what do we have to take into account when we're looking at an E2 reaction in terms of stereo or regioselectivity, rather? We have to look at the type of substrate, first of all, but they kind of gave that away in the question when they told us it's going to be an E2. But then we look at the base and we determine whether it's unhindered or hindered. If it's hindered, then the Hoffman product is going to predominate. The Hoffman product is the less substituted alkene or the less stable alkene. If we're dealing with an unhindered base, then it's going to be able to pluck off the proton that will produce the most substituted alkene, which is the Zaitsev product. 